Boundary layer separation has one of the most profound implications for aerodynamics, which is why it's so important. Let's start by considering a boundary layer that's growing over a flat plate. The first important fact is that the change in pressure in the y direction, dp by dy, of the pressure field, which is a function of x and y, and we might as well take the origin as being the front of the plate, uh, the change in pressure in the y direction is very, very small. So it's approximately equal to zero. Now, physically, we're just simply saying that if we look along a line at constant x, so uh, look at this red line here, the pressure at the top there uh, is the same as the pressure all the way along uh, in that direction. So let's think about the velocity profile in the boundary layer. Uh, up in the free stream, we have uh, the free stream velocity. Then in the boundary layer, the bits that have been affected by the presence of the boundary, we see that velocity tail down to zero. So the arrows, uh, velocity vectors, if you like, will look like that. So I've just copied that underneath. And in this first case here, uh, we'll say that the pressure change in the x direction, dp dx, is equal to zero. In other words, the pressure is constant um, in the x direction. Now let's imagine the same boundary layer, but in a flow where the pressure is changing in the x direction. So let's have to start with uh, a high pressure on the upstream side and a low pressure on the downstream side. Uh, what will this look like? Well, the free stream might be slightly faster because we've gone from a high pressure to a low pressure, so we might start here. And let's think about the fluid. The fluid in the free stream has been accelerated a bit. The fluid down at the bottom, let me circle that here, um, which was going at a lower velocity, will also be accelerated. And so we'll find that we get a steeper velocity profile at the bottom of the boundary layer that has arisen because the pressure gradient uh, in the x direction is the same all the way down the boundary layer and so it really accelerates the flow at the bottom. And what I want to highlight here most of all is that at the bottom of the boundary layer we have a steeper velocity profile. And now if we consider the opposite case with a low pressure upstream going to a high pressure downstream uh, what are we going to find? Well, we'll find that the free stream has been slowed down a little bit. And let's follow this down. Everything in the boundary layer will have been slowed down by the same pressure gradient. So we're going to find that the boundary layer will do this. Now it's going to want to go down to negative velocities over here. Um, but of course at the bottom it won't be able to because of momentum diffusion from the uh, flat surface here. We need the no-slip condition. In other words, zero velocity there. So the velocity does that. It bends around. And what we find is that we've got normal flow at the top and a little bit of reverse flow at the bottom and that's the key bit at the bottom of the boundary layer we've got a little bit of reverse flow so what we have is uh, what we call an adverse pressure gradient uh, going from uh, going from low pressure to high pressure uh, causing a little bit of reverse flow at the bottom of the boundary layer earlier on we looked at couette flow and poisson flow um, in other words the flow between two flat plates with the top plate moving and the bottom plate stationary uh, with or without a pressure gradient in the flow. Uh, let's look at the case of pure cuvette flow. Remember here we have a top plate moving at velocity v, a bottom plate that's stationary. Uh, so if we draw the, um, the velocity at the bottom, by the no-slip condition it's going at velocity 0, and the velocity at the top plate by the no-slip condition is going at velocity v. Uh, in just pure cuvette flow we have a constant pressure in the x direction, so dp dx is equal to zero, uh, and we get a linear velocity profile between the two plates. So it looks like this. It's not quite the same as a boundary layer, remember, because the boundary conditions at the top are different, although the boundary condition at the bottom of the plate uh, is pretty much the same. Now we also looked at the case of Couette flow, where we have a pressure gradient uh, uh, in the um, positive x direction. So the top plate's still moving at velocity v, the bottom plate still stationary, and we have a high P on the left and a low pressure on the right. And now we put in the bottom velocity, it's zero, the top velocity again is V, but now we have a parabolic velocity profile between the two that looks something like this. So the velocity vectors moving in that direction. 
and note we have exactly the same thing as we had for the uh, boundary layer at the base of the wall we have a steeper velocity profile in the case with a favorable pressure gradient than we did in the case up here with no pressure gradient at all and then we looked at Kuwet Poisson flow with an adverse pressure gradient so a low pressure upstream and a high pressure downstream and here we found that uh, well once again we have by the no-slip condition a zero velocity at the bottom uh, velocity of V at the top but now we have a parabola going the other direction which looks something like this and if I draw in the velocity vectors we have at the bottom a little region of reverse flow and that's exactly the same as we have in the boundary layer here so we've seen this concept before what I want to talk about next is why this has such profound implications uh, for uh, aerodynamics so let's consider the flow around a curved surface um, and to start with, let's consider inviscid flow. Now, if we consider the front, uh, because it's inviscid flow, we're going to have no, or oh, sorry, perfect slip at the bottom, um, in fact, perfect slip throughout, and the velocity profiles might look like that. That's a flat velocity profile. Uh, around the middle, uh, we're going to find a slightly higher velocity, simply because the fluid is having to get round the obstacle. So, I've drawn that in here a higher velocity but again a flat velocity profile because the flow is inviscid and around the back of the object we'll find the same velocity that we had around the front of the object if it's symmetric uh, in the inviscid flow case and let's look at the pressures uh, let's say at the front um, we have a high pressure of course everything's relative but let's just call that high Around the middle of the object, of where it's going faster, we'll have a low pressure, and then around the back, we'll have the same pressure that we had at the front. Call that high. Now, of course, in any practical situation, the fluid will have a finite viscosity, and this means that around the boundary, we'll get a boundary layer. So let's draw in, in red, uh, the velocity profiles for a viscous fluid, uh, fairly similar in the free stream, but then near the boundary, we're going to drop off in the velocity. Now note that in going from the front to the middle we're going from a high pressure gradient to a low pressure gradient so that's a favorable pressure gradient and we're going to find that the boundary layer gets a little bit steeper everything's being accelerated due to the pressure gradient so we get a slightly steeper boundary layer profile and of course that means that there'll be no reverse flow around the front of the object however around the back we're going from a low pressure to a high pressure we have here an adverse pressure gradient um, and so let's draw on the velocity profile in the boundary layer where we'll start off the same in the free stream but then we'll get a little bit of reverse flow at the bottom uh, in the boundary layer so those are the velocity profiles around the back and this has very profound implications for the flow note in the middle all the fluid in the boundary layer is moving forwards uh, at the at the back of the object some of the fluid at the bottom of the boundary layer is moving back now where these two meet we're going to get a mini stagnation point and the fluid is going to have to move uh, upwards like that uh, and if we were to draw the boundary layer at that point we of course would find that it had a velocity profile that looked something like that zero velocity um, just above the wall now this completely changes the nature of the flow the flow is coming around the front of the body, moving past the top, hitting this sort of stagnation point, and then moving up, and it'll bend away. The flow at the back has reversed. And so what we have uh, here is called a separation point. And behind it, we have a recirculation region. And all this arises because of the effect of an adverse pressure gradient on the boundary layer. And here's an example of that. Um, this is taken from an album of fluid motion. Uh, this is a sphere, a metal sphere, that's been coated in condensed milk, of all things, and then placed in a flow um, from left to right. Now we can see um, in this picture the sphere. I'll just draw it around the front. It looks something like that. We can see around the front that there's no separation. Uh, we've got a favorable pressure gradient. It'll be high pressure here and a low pressure 
at the shoulder of the sphere and the boundary layer remains attached. However, around the back we can see quite clearly that around this point here the flow has separated and moved away from the sphere and uh, if we draw in the streamlines they look something like that and here we have a region of reverse flow. And this has arisen because the boundary layer has separated. Now there's another important point I want to raise here which is that um, this has happened in an entirely laminar flow. Some people confuse separation and turbulence and there's no reason to do that. We haven't even mentioned turbulence yet in this course and yet we've got separation. And the separation of a boundary layer is an entirely laminar phenomenon. Now I'll explain briefly why this has such an important impact on aerodynamics um, by considering what was called d'Alembert's paradox which is essentially that you can't get any lift in an inviscid flow uh, that is completely irrotational. So let's consider inviscid flow around a cylinder. Um, I'll just highlight two things here. We've got a stagnation point at the front where the flow uh, goes to zero, flow velocity goes to zero, and a stagnation point at the back where the flow velocity goes to zero. And this flow is obviously symmetric um, up and down as well as left and right. And because it's symmetric, there's no lift on this object. Uh, equally, there's no drag. Um, underneath, I'm going to draw a picture of a wing. And this wing is in the same inviscid flow as before. And again, I want to draw your attention to the stagnation point at the front, the stagnation point at the back, but particularly to this region here, where because it's an inviscid flow, there can't be any boundary layer separation because there aren't any boundary layers. The flow at the very back, let me draw this as a zoom, the flow at the back whips right round the back without separating and reaches the stagnation point or the separation point and then moves away. Uh, sorry, the stagnation point, not the separation point here, uh, which is just a purely inviscid um, stagnation point. So the flow, because it can't separate, because there are no boundary layers, just moves straight round the back and then hits the stagnation point and moves away. And in fact, for this wing, just as for the cylinder, um, it turns out that there's no lift and again no drag. Um, which is d'Alembert's paradox, because we know that in the real world these things do have lift and they do have drag. So what's the difference? Well, let's look at the cylinder in a viscous flow, which we've just done. And we know that in a viscous flow, the flow separates at these two points here, and we get two separation points. And this means that we get uh, a little bit of reverse flow around the back of the cylinder. And in fact, what you can do, and you'll do this in the third year, is look at the pressure around the front of the cylinder, the pressure around the back of the cylinder, and from that you'll realize that there is a drag force on the cylinder. This, in this case, of course, though, in the viscous case, um, it's symmetric top to bottom, so in this case there's still no lift. But now let's look at the aerofoil. The, the flow comes in uh, straight, as before. Uh, let's follow the streamline at the bottom. Now this went around the bottom of the aerofoil, and in the inviscid case it would have whipped around the back to the separate the, to the stagnation point and then moved away. In this case though, to whip around like that would involve an enormous adverse pressure gradient and the boundary layer separates and this bit of fluid moves off like that. The bit on the top now um, moves around the back and follows it uh, and you get what's called at the back here the cutter condition and uh, which essentially says that the flow um, remains parallel at the tip. And this has arisen because the boundary layer at the tip, the, sorry, at the back of the wing here, um, can separate, can move away, um, and let the flow line up as it has done here to give you the cutter condition. Now you can think of why this gives you lift in all sorts of ways. Um, the classical way at school is to say at the top you've got a low pressure underneath, sorry, low pressure on top, and a high pressure underneath, which gives you lift. Another way is to look at the streamline curvature which says that because the cur streamlines are curving all uh, downwards, the pressure at the top must be higher than the pressure just above the wing, which must therefore be lower, whereas underneath it's kind of the other way around. The way they're turning means that the pressure at the bottom here must be lower than the pressure just underneath, which must be higher. And because these two pressures must be the same, because the fluid streamlines uh, all came from the same flow, which was going in the horizontally um, upstream, 
Uh, it means that you must have a lower pressure on top of the wing than underneath the wing, and therefore you must have lift. Or you can do the crudest way possible, which is the one I actually prefer, which is to say that the fluid came in horizontal, and when it left, it was going down. In other words, behind this wing, you've got a whole bunch of fluid that's been pushed down, just as you have underneath a helicopter, and that 